Showing on this episode of Law Weekly, we have the views of a former president of the Nigerian Bar Association, senior advocate of Nigeria, Dr. Ulisa Agbakoba. He speaks about the controversy generated by the letter written by 14 justices of the Supreme Court to the Chief Justice of Nigeria on issues of funding, welfare, transparency, and budgeting. Also showing on the program, reactions trail the mild drama of human rights activist Malcolm Omirabu, who appeared at the Supreme Court on Thursday, dressed in his legal robes, complemented with other traditional apparel, plus a recap of some of the top trending legal stories. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shueli. The National Judicial Council, NJC, has described as unprecedented and an international embarrassment the issue of judges' welfare, which has become a subject of litigation at the National Industrial Court. The NJC made the submission at the resumed hearing of the suit, which was instituted by a senior advocate of Nigeria, Mr. Sebastian Horn, seeking salary increase for Nigerian judges. Meanwhile, plans to have an out-of-court settlement on the matter proved futile as the Council to the National Assembly says no headway has been made with respect to resolving the matter amicably. To get a deeper perspective on the matter, I spoke to a former president of the bar and former member of the NJC, Dr. Ulisa Agbakoba, on how we got to this stage. The letter written by 14 justices of the Supreme Court to the CJN, bordering on issues of welfare and transparency, attracted a lot of reactions and continues to generate a lot of reactions. What are your thoughts about the content of that letter? I'm not shocked. I'm not surprised. The neglect of the judiciary has been a long-standing problem. Even when my father was chief judge of chief justice of his central state, he didn't have a car to go to to his court. Yeah, Seventy two. As far back as then. Yep. So it's a long standing problem. Somehow the judiciary gets forgotten as the third and equal arm of government. So you find the executives appropriate things to themselves, the legislature. I mean you can't compare a judge of the Supreme Court to a senator terms of the emoluments. But what worries me is the reaction that the NJC has brought to bear on the problem. I was on the NJC once, and I remember when I was there, uh, Mr. Justice, the first female CJN, wasn't, wasn't interested. And that was what led me to file, because there been four cases on judicial funding. The first was by Juson. The second was by me in the Federal High Court in relation to federal judges. The third was by me in the Kitty High Court in relation to state High Court judges. The fourth was by my predecessor as the NBA president, uh, Alege, Austin Alege, who brought the case in the Supreme Court and I was an amicus. Now, the shock of it all was that the Supreme Court in that you know, case failed entirely to talk about how they would be paid. They just didn't. What they concentrated on was exactly what the number 10, which, in fact, in fairness to Buhari, is in favor of the judiciary. That's the one they struck down. And then they failed to resolve the issue how the judiciary should be funded. That was and a Which issue. is an issue that affects them. Absolutely. Is it that they didn't realize? I don't understand it. When I read the decision, it was shocking. The other point is, why is it that they have not implemented the decision of Justice Mohammed of the Federal High Court? Because it made it very clear, the judiciary will not be funded by the executive. The way they get funded is to drop their own estimates straight to the National Assembly. But they're not doing that. So the decline of funding in the judiciary has been a long-standing problem. Long-standing. I know some couple of Supreme Court judges who died because they were waiting for funds from government. The other point, which is not very good is the justice of the Supreme Court tend to see that their heads of courts are comfortable. All heads of courts in Nigeria are comfortable. They don't really look after the other judges, whether in the Federal High Court, on the State High Court, or in the Supreme Court. Nikitobi retired, he had no house. Justice Adelike retired, no house. But the heads of court, the, the head of court of the Supreme Court, that's the CJN, is well looked after in terms of housing allowance and retirement allowance. So that's the inequality. Why does this one appear to be different from that of the other judges? Because they look after themselves. That's what is causing the problem. 
The CJN is said to be traveling all the time with his wife and children, but he will not allow the others to go. That's the that's the that's the that's what is riling them up. So I'm happy that they wrote the letter. I think it's well well well, well intended because the court is going down. Go to Supreme Court. We are doing 20, 13 cases. What kind of a court is that? Ten years to get decisions out of the Supreme Court. Another maybe six or seven. So if you have a basic case in the High Court, you are going to spend twenty years. So there's no confidence in the system. But with the way you spelt it out now, mm -hmm. where do we look to for solutions? Should it not be the NJC, which what is, is the NJC? headed by the same CJN no, absolutely. who That's takes care of himself? Well, absolutely. Alone. That's the point I'm so making. So where is the solution going to come from? So I would like to see the NJC call an emergency meeting of the of the council and to say we have a letter from the uh, Supreme Court justices. So it's not for the CJN. That was a mistake. It's not for the CJN to. But he's going to sit on it. He's a he's a person directly affected. So I would have advised them to write the letter to the NGC and to take up this matter because it's very serious. If justice of the Supreme Court are writing for basic necessities, very it's embarrassing. It's very embarrassing. There's also this controversy over the payment of salaries, pensions, and other emoluments of judicial officers. The states, through the body of state attorneys general, push the responsibility to the federal government and the NGC. What do you think? About that? It's not even clear. That's the problem. That's why that case in the Supreme Court would have resolved all this. Who does what isn't clear. What are the lines, federal judges and state judges? State governments, what should they bear? Federal judges, who gets to pay them? We need to have all these things resolved. And that was the case that we thought the Supreme Court would have taken the opportunity to say, state governments, this is your responsibility. State courts, you pay for it. Federal courts, but they didn't say so. So is it now a lost cause? I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know why they did not take that opportunity. Uh, that opportunity gone forever? Mm, unless somebody files another case. But then how many cases are going to keep filing? I filed my first case in 2013 or 2010. I don't know. 10 years, 12 years ago. So, you know, what? why I'm not sorry for them, the justice of the Supreme Court? Well, maybe, maybe I should be sorry for the justices because they have no... They have no, no. In institutional, you know, power to such. do anything. Yeah. But they, some of them who wrote this letter sat on the appeal, sat on this case. So the question would be, why didn't you use the opportunity of the case to set out what you're entitled to? Perhaps they you didn't know, understand the issues. Know, and then the Supreme Court? <laughs> that would be shocking. Do you know that the Supreme Court itself shot itself in the foot about um, so many years ago in the resource control case? Now, in the resource control case, the issue was who gets what. So the Supreme Court suddenly discovered that Section 162 sub 9, which allocated money to the judiciary, was unconstitutional. And I was shocked. And in this, Amicus Curia appeared. I raised the point that the Supreme Court has no power to declare the Constitution unconstitutional. They don't, they don't have that power, yet yeah, they declared it. So 162 sub 9 of the Constitution allocated federal funding to the judiciary. And since that went, this thing has become a big problem. I would have, and I asked them to reverse themselves because it was an error. The Constitution can never be wrong, even if it is wrong. So where did the Supreme Court get the power to strike down Section 162 sub 9? And that was giving the Supreme Court, I mean the judiciary, a substantial tranche of money. So you can see that in so many ways they shot themselves on the foot. They've been shooting themselves in the foot. Is there any role that the NBA can play yes, now that the issue has come yes, to yes. the fore? The like NBA this? can play a role by taking up the cause because the limited role of judges to be seen and not heard or to be heard and not seen, whichever. So we in the bar, president of the Nigerian Bar Association, I think would have a strong role to play using the political system in the National Assembly. Of course, Sebastian Horn has a case in court about the poor emoluments of you know, judges. So all of this can come together and maybe, and then Wale Olatne, who has chairman of the body of benchers, body of benchers the new advisory judicial, there, there are all kinds of organs that I think can interface and to say, no, 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 it's time that we stop this nonsense of paying judges badly. Because when they're paid badly, Justice suffers, people suffer. Because I, I hear all the bodies that you've mentioned that can play a role, but then there are also people who have said 
the NBA and the body of ventures, there's also a supremacy battle between them over who should be saying what on behalf of the bar. No, no, for the bar, of course. The body of ventures cannot speak for the bar. The bar speaks through the NBA president for on the bar issues. But what I, I, I think is that even though these are different bodies, they need to collaborate on matters affecting the legal and judicial system. So I don't see that there should be a problem. I'd like to have the NBA, body of benchers, bodies of attorneys general, body of senior advocates of Nigeria, all come together to present a problem, which is poor funding of the judiciary. And how can that be reversed? So you talked about the case filed by Sebastian Owen here. Mm -hmm. That can be used to redress all of this. Absolutely. Issues. So how, Absolutely. What, how do you think that the Supreme Court judges who are going to sit on these cases should be handling? No, no, no. I don't think it ought to be handled from the point of view of um, uh, a decision of the court. It, it ought to be a policy matter. I would like to see a policy discussion between the MBA, body of benchers, body of senior advocates, attorneys general, attorney general of the federation playing a big role. So they come together, review all the issues, and then present a paper to the president. And I hope the CJN himself will be prepared to lead this work because if he's not, that is not a problem. He ought to be prepared. I don't know why few CJNs with great respect to them have been keen to lead the crusade. Very few. You don't have, you don't, you don't have, I mean, if 14 justices of the Supreme Court could sign this, why hasn't the CGN, apart from his defensive let letter, said, okay, you know what, let's go forward? Because he must be the person leading the process. But then he's comfortable, so why would he Well, that's part of the problem. The only man I always keep talking about of blessed memories, Justice Dahiru Mustafa, he was the one CGN who was absolutely very vocal. So we need a CGN who is prepared to lead the crusade and to say, we can't walk in these conditions anymore. People don't have faith in the Nigerian judiciary because we don't have the funding to do our work with utmost speed. Nobody has confidence in the judiciary if it takes them 20 years to resolve a case from the High Court to the Supreme Court. So are they not concerned about that? They ought to be concerned. So those are the issues I think should challenge the, coming pres the new president of Nigeria. Because if you want to turn around Nigeria, economic development, you must look to how the courts work. Foreign investors, local investors will not invest in Nigeria if the dispute resolution mechanism is shaky. So one would like to hear what the presidential candidates. all these presidential candidates, apart from the big issue of their primaries, what exactly are they going to do? Would they do about law and order, emoluments of the judiciary, how the courts work, the speed of justice, the, the sort of thing that... Um, um, What's his name now? The vice president did when he was attorney general. general of Lagos. Absolutely revamped and renovated the the court system of Lagos State. That's something that I'd like to see uh, our presidential candidates speak to. Since you've gone to politics, let, let's go there. What's your reaction to some presidential candidates submitting names of persons they term placeholders as their running mates? It's a smart move. It's not illegal. It's a smart it's move. Not no, no, it's not illegal because you have you have the time and the possibility to substitute. So there's that window of substitution. It's not nice because it tends to show, are you not ready? If you cannot even name who your vice presidential candidate will yes. be, you need to put in, you know, there's a dogfight. For instance, for APC, they're concerned about Muslim, Muslim, or Christian, Muslim. I think they feel that Muslim, Muslim is the best way to go. But they're concerned about what will be the backlash. So. They're not sure. So in sizing it up, time runs out on them. So they say, okay, what we'll do, just put the, what you call it, placeholder. We'll put a place, very nice name, placeholder. We'll put somebody to hold the place. And then when we finally resolve our problems, we'll put the correct name. So, so. There's this, also this issue of, um, the case, when you look at the cases of Lawan versus Machina and Akpabio versus Epuadon, mm -hmm. can INEC accept names of candidates who didn't participate C in not. the primaries? You know, what's not happening is people are not looking at the new electoral act. The new electoral act, and I'm happy that it has done that, because I've always felt that INEC is a weak regulator. So I'm happy that the new electoral act authorizes INEC to reject names if it did not come through proper process. So there will be a question whether some of these names that went to INEC by the parties can properly be so tabled when they did not take part in primaries, because some of them were busy 
at the presidentials. When they lost, they then ran to the senatorial, at which time it had closed. Uh, that two people are in mind, the Senate president and um, Babio. So clearly, I would not um, allow them, if I was Heineck, they're out. They can't eat at both sides. Presidential, you take a bite, you lose, then you run down to the Senate. So they're absolutely out. Let's see what INEC will do. Because some people are saying, well, it's the party's business. No, no, it's not. INEC has power in the new law to check whether you've gone through the process. And if you have not, to reject your name, to say, Mr., you didn't take part in the primaries. So how come you've reached me? I need to see that you've gone through due process, proper procedure. And our law says you must present yourself at the primaries. It's almost like a Mechi case. Yes. Mechi and um, uh, Omehia. Omehia. Uh, Omehia didn't take part in the process. And the Supreme Court struck it down. So I think what they're doing is they're setting up the situation for lawyers to make a lot of money. And they, uh, that, for that, there's no complaint. To another trending issue, there was a mild drama at the Supreme Court premises in Abuja on Thursday when a human rights activist, Malcolm Omirabo, appeared in his lawyer robes, complimented with other traditional apparel. The human rights lawyer, who said he's a traditionalist, argued that his decision was based on the Supreme Court judgment that ruled in favor of Muslim students wearing their hijab in Lagos schools. I'm very happy about the decision. You know, you know, in, 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 this, this, this has been going on for some time. In the case of um, uh, the provost of Kwara State Polytechnic, um, Kwara State uh, College of, uh, the provost of Kwara State uh, College of Education versus um, uh, Basirat, the, the court was very clear that um, uh, the students should wear their hijab, the female students, and they should not be stopped or prevented because to do so will amount to a violation of their right to freedom of religion, dignity to their person, and also discrimination. Just Friday here, yeah, the Supreme Court also uh, gave a decision like that. So you see, uh, it, 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 I mean, the foundation for this is, um, uh, is, is well spelled out. The other cases, you have Abdul Karim versus Lagos State, where the court held similar decision. So if that can be done to female students to wear a job, you can apply it to uh, every other religion. Because to stop me from dressing like this will amount to a violation of my right to freedom of um, uh, thought, conscience, and religion, and also it will be... Uh, uh, it will be it will be a violation of I mean to be it to be discriminatory, and therefore unconstitutional. And that's why I've, I I felt confident of coming to the Supreme Court, and I came. I I went there and I sat before my lords, and they were pleased with my appearance, until they have to reconstitute. And just before we go, a recap of some of the top trending legal stories in the news. We begin with the report that the Supreme Court on Friday struck out the suit by President Muhammadu Buhari and the Attorney General of the Federation challenging Section 8412 of the Electoral Act. The court expunged the suit on the grounds that it lacks the jurisdiction to entertain same as it constitutes an abuse of court process. The president and the AGF, senior advocate of Nigeria, Abubakar Malami, had filed the suit at the Supreme Court seeking an interpretation of the controversial clause in the Electoral Amendment Act 2022. Among other things, they asked the court to strike out the section of the Electoral Act which they argued was inconsistent with the nation's constitution. In its decision, however, the Supreme Court held that President Buhari, having assented to the bill on February 25, 2022, cannot turn around to challenge same. Justice Emmanuel Agim, who read the unanimous judgment of the court, said allowing the suit to have its way will amount to approbating and reprobating at the same time, and no court of law should allow that. Staying in Abuja, but this time the Federal High Court, Justice Mobolaji Olajumo has stopped the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, from ending the voter registration on June 30, 2022. Justice Olajumo granted an order of interim injunction following the hearing of an argument on motion ex parte by Socio-Economic Rights and Accountability Project, SERAP. 
Serap and 185 other concerned Nigerians had earlier this month filed a lawsuit against INEC asking the court to declare unconstitutional, illegal and incompatible with international standards the failure of the electoral body to extend the deadline for voter registration to allow eligible Nigerians to exercise their rights. The suit has been adjourned to the 29th of June for the hearing of the motion on notice for interlocutory injunction. Another judge of the Federal High Court sitting in Abuja, Justice Donatus Okorowo, has convicted and wound up Makot Nigeria Limited, one of the 30 companies associated with the Process and Industrial Development Limited, PNID, for money laundering. The company was convicted on Thursday, June 16, 2022, after being found guilty of four count charges bordering on money laundering preferred against it by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. In his judgment, Justice Okorowa also ordered that the company be wound up and its entire assets forfeited to the federal government of Nigeria. In the case of the late gospel singer Osinachi Nwachuku, her mother, 61-year-old Caroline Madu, has narrated before the FCT High Court in Abuja, threatens to kill her daughter. According to Madu, 42-year-old Osinachi was last seen in December during a church program before her death on April 8th. When the singer was sick, Madu claimed to have told Osinachi that she needed treatment. She, however, said she would have to plead with her husband, adding that if she visited her, her husband would kill her. On Osinachi's health status, Madu maintained her daughter only told her that she had an ulcer, whereas the husband had claimed she died of lung cancer. The Attorney General of the Federation, Abubakar Malami, had instituted a homicide charge against the late Osinachi's husband. He had pleaded not guilty to a 23-count charge bordering on domestic violence and homicide, among others. In Lagos, a three-man panel of the Court of Appeal on Thursday, June 23, upheld the conviction of a former managing director of the defunct bank PHB PLC, Francis Atuche, as well as the bank's former chief financial officer, Ugo Anyawu. Atuche and his co-convict Anyawu had approached the appellate court to set aside their conviction by Justice Latifa Okunu of the Lagos High Court sitting in Ikeja, Lagos, on June 16, 2021, over a 25.7 billion naira fraud. The panel, comprising Justices Sadiq Umar, Adebukola Banjoku and Kayode Bada, upheld the EFCC's arguments and unanimously dismissed the appeal. Still in Lagos, the Special Offences Court, sitting in the Ikeja area, has issued a bench warrant for the arrest of suspected internet froster Ismaila Mustafa, popularly known as Momfa. Justice Mujisala Dada issues the warrant following his continued failure to present himself for trial. Momfa was arrested on January 10, 2022, by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, and arraigned on January 12, alongside his company, Ismalob Global Investment Limited, an eight-count charge of alleged money laundry of over six billion naira. He pleaded not guilty to all the counts. After he was granted bail, he has failed to appear in court on two scheduled days for his trial prompting Justice Munisola Dada to revoke his bill and order his arrest. The court then adjourned further proceeding till June 30. And we round off with the report that the trial of former Deputy Senate President Ike Ekwerimadu and his wife Beatrice Ekwerimadu has been adjourned to July 7th. The London Metropolitan Police said it arrested and charged the duo for conspiring to bring a child to the for organ harvesting. At the Oxbridge Magistrates Court, the couple pleaded not guilty to the charge. And that's the program this week. Many thanks for watching. Don't forget that you can catch a repeat of this program or past episodes on our YouTube page. Please feel free to also share with us your comments on any of the issues we discussed today. I'm Shola Shirley. Thank you for watching.